Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Dawn Van Dam and I am the General Manager of Cambridge Health Tech Associates. Today we are very excited to be bringing you a unique opportunity for you to learn more about this exciting program called the Nobel Laureates School Visits Program. The key goal of this initiative is to inspire the next generation of intellectual leaders wherever they exist across the world. Um, right now you'll hear that we have some programs that have been going on in the U.S. and China, but we hope to have the support from all of you to help expand this across the globe. And what you'll also find in today's presentation is there's an opportunity for you to jump in and take some action and find some schools where you live that might be interested in bringing in a Nobel Laureate to a program in your area. So with no further ado, I will uh, take you through some introductions and get us underway for today's webinar. So just a little bit about ourselves, Cambridge Health Tech Associates. We offer services in three different areas, the first being consulting and market research. So if you need to understand who your potential customers would be or what the positioning for your product might be, be or the pricing or how best to approach them. That's what we do in consulting and market research, whether it be through a market research project, a marketing plan development, strategic plan development, or a business plan. The second thing that we do, which I'll talk to you about a little bit more in a moment, is our Technology Evaluation Consortium, which is a fabulous um, initiative which has been going on for nearly 10 years now to bring new technologies to the pharmaceutical and biotech industry to have them evaluate them and see where they fit in their drug discovery and development pipeline. And then a new service that we launched uh, about a year ago um, in the area of marketing and communications, because we have such a tremendous database of people, over 900,000 people in life sciences, and we have great experience in marketing and promoting organizations in the science scientific area, we offer a full service marketing and communications um, services to organizations across the world. And so today you'll see a little bit of our marketing and communications because you arrived today to listen to this talk. And also we host webinars for organizations like this or for your organization to share your knowledge around the world. Just a little bit more about our Technology Evaluation Consortium. It's been um, a, a tremendous opportunity to showcase new science or new uses of old science. And really because our goal as an organization is to transform science into commercial success, so that it gets out of people's brains and into helping people, um, moving uh, medications, devices, diagnostics forward, helping to make the world a better place um, for all of us. That's really our key mission. So if you'd like to learn any more about our services, please do contact me separately. So with no further ado, I'm going to give an introduction today um, of the speakers. And um, there's such a fabulous panel that it will take me a minute or so just to cover off everybody's background. So the first up today will be Dr. Edward Shapiro, who is a Russian-American scientist, engineer, and inventor. He obtained his education at the Yofi Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg, Russia. He has lived, though, in the United States since 1979 with his family, and throughout his career, Dr. Shapiro has worked in the high-tech industry, including the fields of crystal growth, direct energy conversion, film, thin film displays, and lighting. He also co-founded New Vision, where he created and experimentally proved the idea of an apparatus which is able to detect nuclear materials and cargo. In 2008, however, Dr. Shapiro founded this amazing organization called the Nobel Laureate School Visits Program. Since then, he has been devoted to fostering the growth of this program, and he is determined to have more students benefit from it around the world. Our keynote speaker today is Dr. David Abraham. He is a Nobel Laureate with, for the Peace Prize. So Dr. Abraham graduated as valedictorian at the Muhlenberg College and then attended the John Hopkins University School of Medicine and subsequently interned at the Harriet Lane Program in Pediatrics at John Hopkins. He then fulfilled his military obligation at the Communicable, Communicable Disease Center as the medical advisor of the National Medical Audiovisual Center. Following a year as a pediatrician at the University of Arizona, he then completed a residency in psychiatry at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. In 1981, he was named the Director of Psychiatric Research at St. Elizabeth's Hospital and initiated a series of studies on the long-term effects of hallucinogenic drugs in humans. 
In that year, he served as a consultant to the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Marijuana and Health for the Institute of Medicine in Washington, D.C. So all this brought him to one of his seminal works, which is that data from his research efforts contributed to the development of the Diagnostics and Statistics Manuals of the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Abraham served as an advisor to the Substance Use Disorder Committee to revise DSM-4, which is the current Diagnostic Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. He was then named Director of Substance Abuse Program at the Tufts University School of Medicine and Clinical Professor of Psychiatry. He then became the Chief of the Alcohol and Drug Treatment Services at the Butler Hospital, an affiliate of Brown University, and currently he conducts a psychiatric practice and writes essays, nonfiction, and fiction. In, interesting, interestingly, um, Dr. Abraham also has many other awards and honors, including the Iris Peabody and Emmy Awards for Best Public Television Programs in a Number of Years. So he's not only a, um, a Nobel winner, but a, a celebrity as well. He's a founding member of uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and importantly, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, where Dr. Abraham was an author of the constitution of those organizations. And then subsequently, in 1985, because of all of this work, he shared at Oslo in the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize. And in 2007, more recently, he was elected Distinguished Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. So he will be our keynote speaker, but just to quickly introduce the rest of the speakers, and then I'll turn it over to them. Uh, Kenneth Jenks is the principal of Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School. He graduated from the University of Massachusetts Amherst with a Bachelor of Arts in History. Then he taught at Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School as a history teacher for nearly 15 years. During this time, he also served three years as an officer, including president of the Dennis Yarmouth Educators Association and an acting assistant principal. During the same time period, he was involved with educational leadership programs at Bridgewater State College and from 1999 to present, he has been the principal of Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School. Galina Pekarovskaya has, uh, is a financial representative of the Wellesley Financial Group, and she's also Ed, Ed's wife and longtime supporter of the Nobel Laureate Program. She joined Wellesley Financial Group in 2010 with the goal of helping business owners, professionals, and families achieve financial balance. Most recently in client services with IBM Corporation, Galena earned service awards for her proven track record of managing a wide range of premium client agreements and delivering consistent client satisfaction. She's been a longtime supporter of the Nobel Laureate School Visits Program, both wholeheartedly and supporting the organization both emotionally and financially. And then our last speaker today will be Michelle Nemitz, Chief Commercial Officer at Biocision. Michelle joined Biocision in early 2008 with almost 20 years of experience in sales of laboratory products and services. Before joining Biocision, she was Director of Business Development at VWR International, a global laboratory supply distributor where she, where she forged partnerships with global biopharmaceutical customers with complex supply chain requirements. During her tenure at VWR, Michelle had various, held various sales and management positions in the Global Accounts Division. Michelle has also held sales and marketing positions with Wheaton Science Products, and Ishihira Sangyo Kaisha, a Japanese chemical manufacturer with U.S. sales operations based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then there's myself, the moderator for today, Don Van Dam, General Manager of Cambridge Health Tech Associates. So with no further ado, we will turn it over to our introductory comments from Dr. Ed Shapiro and let him uh, take it away and introduce you to this absolutely fabulous program. So Ed, um, you should now have the ball and we'll just, if you can just unmute yourself and move to the next slide, we'll be away to the races. Thank you, Dawn. Dear participants, Nobel Laureate Dr. Abraham, my co-panelists, Administration of CHA Corporation, my name is Ed Shapiro. I represent a public charity whose mission is to organize Nobel laureate school visits. On behalf of our Nobel guests and all panelists, 
It is my privilege and honor to express our deep gratitude and appreciation to Dawn Van Dam and her team for such a brilliant assembly. As if we are all in one room, let us give them a thunderous round of applause. I don't know if you hear my sounds. Yona Bell Gens, yes. we all have a passion, and I'm going to share our passion with you. The passion is to inspire gifted children around the world, people who try to learn and like to learn, that they excel in their studies and persevere beyond what they think their limits are, since there are no limits that they select careers they like and follow in the footsteps of the Nobel laureates and intellectual leaders of their generation. I will impress you with three facts pertaining to the Nobel Prize today. Since 1900, when the Nobel Foundation was established, a few billion humans lived, among them only 875 people like you all listening to our presentation today whose everlasting curiosity, passion for learning and hard work led them to receive the Nobel Prize. This few hundred people epitomize the ultimate achievements of the human mind. Next is to share that Nobel laureates, particularly in scientific nomination, have been the supreme torchbearers for civic courage and scientific integrity. Their fundamental discoveries have been destructive to the wrong interpretation and old doctrines. In most cases, they were shocking to the society and to their professional colleagues alike. In a few cases, they led to, to the attempts on the laureate's life. Next to share with you is to mention that about 40% of all Nobel, Nobelists over the years came from the United States of America. And lastly, about 200 Americans are Nobel laureates and share our land with us. The time given to me today would be well spent if I add to what we described. A couple of further facts. As we all know, Nobel laureates as role models help discover and motivate promising students by demonstrating that doing science is real fun. And they inspire students that they be diligent, curious, and resilient in life. We, be, we were lucky here in Boston to connect with Massachusetts Secondary School Administrators Association in plain language, school principals associations who embraced the idea and supported us all the way. I'm trying to move to my other slide. Here we see Dr. Robert Solow, who received a Nobel Prize in economics, who has been like a godfather to what we do with, with Nobel Prize laureates. He supported us all the way from the very start and helped us attract other colleagues of his class. My special thanks go to 
Principal Jenks, who who was really a hero of this program since he volunteered the very first to host a Nobel visit. You can imagine it was such a trembling moment for me, and I believe for uh, Principal Jenks, and he gave us a remarkable, brilliant start for the future. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, Ed. My pleasure. We spent this four-year time moving across Massachusetts, really crisscrossing the state, north, south, east, west, with 39 Nobel events. In 2012, the situation allowed us to expand, and we moved beyond Massachusetts border to New York City, Chicago, Illinois, and lastly this year to Northern California. There was a remarkable event which allowed us to do that. I attended a conference where I met Michelle Nemitz, a financial officer of Biocision Corporation in Northern California. That was really a greatest and most pleasant discovery, serendipity for me when she expressed interest in our program and graciously financed two Nobel events in Northern California, uh, in Menlo Park and San Francisco, uh, most recently about two Two weeks ago, 22nd of November, we had a great success there and plan to continue our cooperation with the company for the future. We were especially pleased when one of our Chinese partners approached us free years ago in 2010 with a proposal to bring a Nobel laureate to China. Instead, we brainstormed together and decided that it would be more efficient to do this transition the other way around, bringing young talents from China to Boston and organize our Nobel events locally here. My special pleasure is to express my deepest gratitude to Dr. Abraham, who joined our service with three Nobel visits in the most recent times. And we are deeply grateful for his cooperation with us. We received a remarkable response from everyone involved with the program. Students, school administrators, Nobel laureates, the media, we all are grateful and unstoppably ready to proceed with this remarkable project. At the conclusion, I again would like to express my deep gratitude to everyone and invite your questions whenever you're ready. Very best. Thank you.
Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Abraham, and I'm not sure if uh, 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 the question should come now or later, uh, but I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be able to do this uh, webinar today, and I'd like to thank the folks at uh, Cambridge Health Tech. It, it's a really creative idea and great use of the uh, uh, great use of the technology. The um, uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to show a picture of uh, myself and, and some of the work that I was able to do with uh, uh, the kids. But unfortunately, I <laughs> the slide. Oh, there you go. That, that's what I look like. If you can see me, um, that's what I look like. You know, maybe ten or fifteen years ago. Um, uh, my group, uh, not I myself, but my my my, my colleagues and I uh, um, earned the, the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985 for. Um, uh, for uh, essentially uh, alerting uh, um, uh, uh, the, the planet to the dangers of nuclear weapons and nuclear war. And uh, we, we focused uh, on the medical uh, consequences of nuclear weapons and um, uh, established uh, uh, a development of uh, really a, a global movement to try to uh, uh, contain, control, and reduce uh, these very dangerous weapons. And um, and I thought that's what I was supposed to talk about when I came. That that's the that's my group of Americans that shared in the prize. That's me at a much more tender age uh, in the center. Uh, uh, but they're they're just uh, wonderful. They were absolutely wonderful people to work with. And uh, and that is me talking to uh, uh, one of the Chinese groups that uh, um, that Ed mentioned. And uh, it was uh, I thought we were going to talk about nuclear weapons and war and medical con consequences. And there's one of my slides in the background showing how we were able to participate in the reduction of nuclear weapons uh, between the superpowers. But that's not really what the kids wanted to know about. They wanted to know about um, uh, not nuclear weapons and nuclear policy, but they wanted to know about me. <laughs> Come on, guys. Give me a break. This is, you know, the person side of the question, well, they were relentless. They wanted to know how many hours I slept a night. They wanted to know, uh, uh, you know, um, little details of my resume. They, they, these kids did their homework, which is really a, a pleasure to, to discover. They wanted to know about my family. Uh, one of the most uh, poignant uh, questions was, uh, in my work, did I ever make mistakes? And <laughs> I love that question. And I said, every day. Every day, and uh, you know, just to humanize the experience. Um, but um, the uh, but what was uh, uh, most uh, here? I, I can show some other uh, pictures of the kids. There, oh, there they are. They were, they, they, they had a fan club for an hour. It was really a lot of fun. Um, uh, I've given many talks, and uh, uh, this was the only uh, group that actually wanted to escort me to the door. Now, I, I, I presume it wasn't that they were giving me the hook, but that they actually uh, 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 just wanted to hang out a little longer. They, they were very appreciative of the, of the talk. Um, and their questions were really terribly informed. They not only were they informed about uh, uh, you know, sophisticated things like uh, uh, foreign policy, which uh, I had to you know, do some homework about before I actually uh, – uh, uh, you know, stood up and talked, uh, but also about the, the future of nuclear weapons and whether or not they had a role in, in, in foreign policy. They, they were just terrifically sophisticated questions which really put me on my toes. And um, uh, and and after um, talking uh, to these kids, I you know I I was just less worried about the future. I said, my goodness, such talented, intelligent, hardworking, optimistic. Uh, uh, kids uh, uh, would have to um, uh, f foretell a, a, a positive outcome for the human race, and and that was really my experience. And I and I'm sure it was it has been the experience of my uh, my other colleagues who participated in this program. So, uh, Dr. Abraham, how much of your time did you actually spend talking about? Um, your your life and your history versus how much time did you spend talking about um, your contributions that you made that helped you win the Peace Prize? Well, you know, um, uh, it, it varied. At first, I gave the you know my first talk was very technical and it talked about throw rates and death rates and and terrible grim 
you know, topics uh, that, uh, you know, we did our work and, and teaching people about. Um, but but I learned that the kids didn't really want to hear that stuff. Uh, they, they seemed to either know it or they, they, they weren't keyed into that. What they were keyed into was um, uh, the Nobel Prize. And uh, and what that meant, and and how one wins a Nobel Prize, and 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 I and it really forced me to think about um, my own life, my own life path, and and the kids were forcing me to think about it too. And, and as time went on, um, uh, I talked less and less about the uh, uh, nuclear weapons effects, and more and more about the process of of how my group uh, uh, ultimately uh, uh, got to. To that point, and winning the Nobel. The, um, uh, but I think um, uh, uh, you know, kids today are, are you know, uh, uh, many kids today are, are you know, pretty competitive, and the, the you know, educational environment is, is competitive, and uh, the Nobel Prize is kind of an iconic symbol of some kind of success in the world, um, and. Um, and I, I had to take pains to tell the kids that we didn't start out at the beginning saying, well, let's sit down and let's figure out a plan to win the Nobel Prize. No, 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 no. That wasn't the point at all. The point was that uh, we, we, had a, uh, we had a medical mission, and the medical mission was to prevent the planet from blowing itself up. And, uh, and how could we best do that? And, uh, and we set about uh, with, really, I, I would have to say, my colleagues who are among the best minds in medicine. Uh, and we worked for a long time, and we made made sacrifices, and uh, and we ultimately were able to, which, you know, achieve the, the little bit that we did achieve in, in this in this field. Um, and then one day I was driving to work, um, and I had heard that I heard on the radio that we had won the Nobel Prize, and uh, I, I I wasn't I wasn't expecting that. That wasn't really what most of us were expecting. Um, and um, and it was uh, 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 and I and I think the kids needed to hear that that the more the most important thing is not the prize forget eyes on the prize what what I try to teach the kids was eyes on the work eyes on what's important eyes on what your values are eyes on how you spend your time and and, and I think they really heard that and when they asked you um, what was your path like to getting to become a Nobel laureate, what what tidbits did you share with them? Well, um, well, it, that's, that's, that's again, uh, that's one of those deep questions uh, that come out of the innocence of youth. And um, I would have to say that it was my my mentors, my my teachers, my professors, my religious uh, education uh, as a Lutheran, uh, 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 learning to. to uh, Take your stand and, and hold to it. Uh, it was my scientific education as a physician, uh, the compassion that was taught to me by my uh, uh, my fellow physicians. Uh, I, th th there are many pieces to the puzzle, and, um, uh, and, and and so I consider that one of the deeper questions. And w is there any sort of advice you give to them at, during these talks? Um, uh, I, 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 I'm not a big advice giver. You know, I'm a psychiatrist, so I, I <laughs> we get paid to not give advice. And um, um, but um, I, I think I, I did. I, I talked about uh, the importance of a work ethic, a balance between uh, 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 the love in your life and the work in your life, um, and um, uh, and to um, uh, to really. Uh, uh, engage your life in terms of uh, uh, passion, because I think that's really uh, the essence of uh, of happiness: a passionate engagement uh, with productivity. Uh, that's that's and, and that is the kind of theme that I, I really have uh, uh, used and, and kids have asked me. Great. Well, thank you. Well, there'll be some um, additional time to come back and ask you some more questions. But I'm going to turn it over right now um, to Galina Pekorovskaya, who's going to give us a little short, um, interesting piece of information about Nobel laureates. And I would just also encourage everyone to keep putting your questions in the chat box. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. I'd like to just invite you to think for a moment. What makes a Nobel laureate? Is it intelligence, determination, luck? Or how about chocolate? Believe it or not, a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine last October found that the average per capita chocolate consumption correlates very well with the number of Nobel laureates that a country produces. And as a matter of fact, Dr. Abraham, who just spoke for us, that he consumes a lot of chocolate. But think again before you devour a pound of chocolate. Can we really make this conclusion? Of course not. Correlation does not mean causation. In other words, just because two variables correlate well, it doesn't mean that one causes the other. Thanks, Galena. That was an interesting way to look at the, the science of uh, moving forward, but also looking at, at, at chocolate, which I know lots of people love, but it might not get you to win the Nobel Laureate Prize. So <clears throat> with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Kenneth Jenks. And uh, Glean, if you can just pass him the ball, and we're good to go. And Ken, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be uh, in education for about 30 years. And I have to say, about half that time spent as a teacher and as an administrator, and the Nobel laureates in the classroom program was probably the most memorable, actually not probably, was the most memorable assembly I've ever experienced in my whole life. It was very inspiring. And as I walked through some of our student comments, I, th I think it targeted that group of students who sometimes feel at a school, do people really want to talk about learning? Do I really want to commit my life to learning? Dennis Yarmouth was lucky enough through Dr. Shapiro and the uh, Massachusetts Secondary School Administrators Association to be a pilot school for one of those first visits. And it was interesting because many people in our school said, oh, okay, that'd be, that'd be great, but so why are you bringing a Nobel laureate to a school? And, and I thought for a second, and I'm always amazed, you know, many times in schools, we'll bring in athletes who will come in who have been very successful and they will talk to students about hard work and rising above the challenges and pushing yourself beyond the limits and perseverance. And that's very, very motivational to a group of students. And at other times, we'll bring in guest speakers who have overcome some tremendous adversity. And again, they'll speak to a group of students, they'll talk about pushing the limits, and they can inspire students. And yet, very rarely do we bring someone in who says, I'm all about an insatiable curiosity in a subject. I believe in academic excellence. And so when there was an opportunity to have a Nobel Prize speaker come in and talk about you know, academic excellence, love of learning, commitment to learning and learning and learning, we were ecstatic. That's our core mission, and that's the best guest speaker you could possibly bring to a school. Dr. Hirschbach came. He met with 45 of our students, and certainly you could do a larger group, and I could speak more to that later. But as a pilot school, we were very interested in making sure geez, our students did prep work. As the previous speaker pointed out, uh, they checked his biography. They prepared this list of 25 or 30 questions uh, for Dr. Hirschbach. And then the day of the meeting, he came in, and it was incredible. It was not a lecture. It was really about a a conversation about learning. It was incredibly interactive. Uh, he was a great speaker. Our students were overwhelmed by you know, his ability to talk about a variety of different topics. Great success. Uh, after the day after the uh, assembly, the guest speaker, we did some debriefing with our students and to a person. They kept on talking about being inspired by someone realizing a love of learning and a passion and a curiosity about a topic. So you have to master that topic. That was very, very important to them. There was also another piece that uh, perhaps we were surprised at. And that was the piece where uh, Dr. Hirschbach, the Nobel laureate, he 
helps shed that image of a one-dimensional being. I think many of our teenagers, high school students, think of Nobel Prize winners as these uh, people who are a little different, a little distant from everyone. And instead, they were like, wow, they're regular people. They're very personable. They have lives, but they also have an incredible uh, drive to learn things and push the limits of knowledge. And that was very motivating to our students. Because in high school, sometimes it's hard to say, I love learning. I just want to learn everything I possibly can about another subject. Uh, for many teenagers, that just doesn't come across as uh, something they want to share with their friends. And so hearing a person who's been tremendously successful say, it's okay to love learning and need to know everything about chemistry and to try to do things to make the world better, that was incredibly motivating for a group of students who often might hear that message from parents or teachers, but when you're hearing it from a Nobel laureate, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more motivating. Uh, there's a variety of quotes on our slides. Uh, there were 30 or 40 quotes our students gave us that we've shared with other folks as we've talked about this experience. They learned about thinking outside the box and sometimes going against conventional wisdom and standing up for your convictions, your academic convictions, if you will. Uh, again, over and over again, they talked about being inspired. Here's some pictures of uh, some of the adults, our staff. Again, we were all, it was an incredible experience. I really just can't capture the feel of it. Uh, many of our students also said it was wonderful to find out that you didn't have to be, you know, you weren't born as the Nobel Prize winner, that you were made, that you worked through opportunities, you took advantage of opportunities to constantly learn, constantly master subject, and be involved in the world. And so therefore, you know, he showed us all right, it's all right to not know what we want to be, that sometimes things work out in ways that you could never imagine. And for a teenager who's not sure of their career path, those words, again, make it, it's good. I can try different things, and I can eventually find the subject that I'm really passionate about, and I'll work for that. We had a small lecture hall experience, Students, they kept on repeatedly talking about, he talks about passion for learning. I, I feel that, but I don't often talk about it. And so again, great experience. It wasn't about his chemistry. It wasn't about why he was awarded a prize. It really was about life and how he viewed things and how he overcame adversity and how he, he stepped up to challenges. And when people, other researchers with him questioned, nah, it's a crazy idea, how he went forward with that, that's great for teenagers. They love hearing that kind of thing and it helps motivate them to learn more. And you know, quickly for the results, uh, again, I, I can't say uh, enough. A Nobel laureate sharing wisdom experiences with high school students, they listen. They really take that in because here's someone who is iconic as, as uh, Dr. Abraham mentioned and it represents sort of the epitome of learning applied to humanity, and that's, students are very idealistic. And to hear that, to hear that was possible, that you follow your dreams, you follow your passion, you master material, you work hard, and you push yourself to the limits, that's an incredible message. And they left highly motivated. Actually, for months after the visit, our students would make references to Dr. Hirschbach. And I guess I'll summarize, in a sense, with this one slide here. I think that's what hopefully education for all of our students is all about. I learned one person through a passion for learning and incredibly hard work can make a real difference in the world. Uh, the visit made a real difference for our students here at Dennis Yarmouth. I highly recommend it to any school. When you have a chance to inspire students, you have to take it. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Ken. That was just fabulous. And if you could pass the ball to Michelle, that would be great. Um, we're going to turn it over to Michelle Nemitz from Biocision, and she's going to tell us about her experience being a sponsor of some of these events and hopefully inspire you to also get involved, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when Ed comes back to speak to us about the logistics. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to present. Um, I had the, um, well, I, let me tell you a little bit about myself and my company, first of all. My name is Michelle Nemitz, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Biocision. 
Um, Biocision is a supplier to the life science industry. We make tools for cell cryopreservation and, uh, and other um, benchtop applications. We were exhibiting at a trade show earlier this year in the summer, and I had the very good fortune to meet Dr. Shapiro while we were at this trade show, and he told me all about his program. And I happened to have two young daughters myself and immediately understood the positive impact that this program could have on uh, on, on students today. Um, I think as Principal Jenks mentioned, um, there are many role models for students to look at these days. A lot of them happen to be, uh, for whatever reason, uh, celebrities, either sports, athletes, or uh, pop singers, or movie stars, or whatever. But here's a chance to offer a real significant and substantive role model to today's uh, youth. So I was uh, really intrigued by the program and uh, very much enamored uh, with Dr. Shapiro and his passion for the program. And so I took uh, the information back to my company and we decided to uh, get involved with Dr. Shapiro to help support the program and expand it beyond Massachusetts and New York and kind of the, 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 the area in the east where he was uh, able to operate locally. Um, so over the last uh, couple of months, we have uh, become an official sponsor of the program and offering him some help with the logistics uh, and financial support of, of his operation. Um, so what have we done specifically? Uh, we have uh, done some outreach here locally with uh, middle schools and high schools. Um, in conversations with Dr. Shapiro, it seemed that that's kind of the best age uh, to connect with these students and have them really understand the significance of the Nobel laureate and um, and be able to have a, a, a you know a good conversation and engagement with the Nobel laureate uh, who so generously is is contributing uh, his or her time to this effort so we 've uh, been focusing on middle schools and high schools uh, so we do some outreach here from our offices at Biocision and we try to find schools who are interested and have the time uh, to, um, to host a Nobel laureate and Dr. Shapiro. And then once we find a school that's interested, we coordinate the visit uh, with Dr. Shapiro and determine the day and the time and, and the, you know, the logistics of getting there and so forth. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we're also uh, working with Dr. Shapiro now to expand the, expand the program even further. Right now, we uh, have done two visits in the United States, or excuse me, two visits in California. Uh, but we, uh, in Northern California specifically, we plan to be expanding this down to Southern California very soon and then beyond California, uh, hopefully very soon as well. Um, but in the Bay Area, which is where Biocision is based, um, there's a very large pool of local Nobel laureates available at you know, three very prestigious universities right here in our backyard. Um, so we've had the uh, privilege of uh, taking Nobel laureate Dr. Douglas Osheroff uh, from Stanford to two Bay Area high schools. One was in Menlo Park. It's a very underserved high school that serves uh, one of the poorest communities in the Bay Area. And um, it's, a, it's a school with, with an administration and a principal who's doing a phenomenal job of inspiring these kids already, keeping them in school, keeping them motivated, pushing them to keep going on with their, their education. And then to bring in this Nobel laureate and spend time with this community that rarely gets any attention at all uh, was a very important um, event for this school and for these students. I had the great privilege of being able to attend and I must say the students were captivated, utterly captivated by Dr. Oshroff. They engaged with him. They had really done some uh, prep work, uh, just uh, trying to get to know his background, get to know why he won the Nobel Prize, and get to know him personally. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in physics, and I think it was a little bit difficult for the students to kind of comprehend uh, what he won the, the prize for, but it, it didn't matter. They still related with him on a human level, and they wanted to know all about him personally. As uh, Dr. Abraham mentioned, and also Principal Jenks mentioned, um, the students are very interested in these people as people, and um, they're curious in the prize. They want to know how they got the prize, and did they set out to get the prize? But what they learn is that these people are just people who happen to have a passion for something, and we're not following their passion in order to win a prize, but just happened to win a prize because they were so passionate about their idea. 
And I think that was a really good lesson for the students, and, and I think the students got it. They listen, and they, they got that message. Um, I, I just want to share with you, uh, we got a thank you letter from the principal of the Menlo Park uh, East Palo Alto Academy, and the last uh, sentence the principal wrote was, if even just one more of our students achieves their goal of going to college because they were inspired by this visit, then your work and the kindness and generosity of Dr. Ashraf is something you should be very proud of. That letter was to uh, Dr. Ed Shapiro. Um, after the visit, the students rallied around Dr. Ashraf as if he were a rock star, and they each wanted individual pictures, they wanted autographs, they, they had lots of questions, and it was really, really um, a very uh, rewarding experience. So Biocision is really happy to um, to uh, participate in this program and offer, fun offer financial support and uh, operational support to help Dr. Shapiro expand this program. Great, thank, thank you. you so much, Michelle. We're, uh, we're so glad to be working with you and the other members of this team to help spread the word. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back to um, Ed Shapiro, who's um, heading up, of course, and started the Nobel Laureate School Visits Program. And Ed, um, we'll just ask you to give a little bit of information about how to contact you and how people participate, and then um, I will begin to ask the whole group a number of questions. But separately, if anyone is interested in learning more, we've posted a survey in the chat box. If you could go in and answer that survey, and most importantly, if you want more information, give us your name and email address so we can follow up with you directly. So I'll turn it over to you, Ed, and you can talk a little bit, and then I'll get to the questions. I think we just need to unmute Ed, and then we're we're good to go. Yes, yes. I'm done. Can you hear? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. How about the ball? Should I move the ball? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Don. Thank you, all my co-panelists, and of course our audience for your for your attention and dedication to what you contribute to and remarkable help we've received from everybody, personally and institutionally. In order to contact us, all we have to do is to visit our website. It's right in front of us here, Nobel Laureate School Visit org. We are a public charity. We are tax ex IRS tax exempt 501c3 organization. All our visits are free for schools to schools. We do not charge anybody. We certainly accept any kind of financial support. We tried many, many times to receive some from educational foundations. However, 100% we, we got, we, we were rejected. No one wanted to invest in us, except our relatives, friends, volunteers. It is beyond words to explain the reaction we receive and testimonials we receive. To describe the process in, in say, two lines, uh, we always have a public announcement about the program. Then uh, about two, three weeks in advance, uh, we visit uh, the school and uh, introduce the program to everybody interested mainly to the principals and the assistants. And then uh, on the day uh, when the visit is scheduled, we bring the laureate to the school. Uh, it is extremely uh, <laughs> nicely arranged. Uh, this is pretty much um, a simulation of uh, what the Nobel laureates see in Stockholm when they receive their prize. They, they are met with love, admiration, and standing ovations. And this is what every, practically every Nobel event 
uh, Keres around. So we have a short introduction. We have um, about 10, 15 minute introduction and then the rest of this whole time, about two and a half hours, is devoted to is devoted to uh, to a Q and A uh, part, which uh, Michelle described the very best. Impossible to add a single word to it, and all and uh, Dr. Abraham as well. This is remarkable. That's all. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. Of course, uh, we have as much uh, local media involved, and the, every visit is broadcast throughout the community, which allows us to, with our 39 visits, communicate with almost 1 million uh, residents throughout Massachusetts, uh, California, uh, New York, and Chicago in the areas we uh, brought Nobel laureates with the schools. And at the very end, uh, when we have maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes, we have to wrap up. Uh, we have a lunch with Nobel laureates and these questions continue and coming and this is fabulous. And uh, all we I learned, and everyone has learned, is that Nobel laureates are not supermen or movie stars or sports heroes, and they never be any of those. They'll always be as you, as our our listeners, our panelists, your families, like carpenters, bakers, you name it, all walks of life. And this is what we bring to our future leaders. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Ed. So um, we'll turn it over to questions now. And I'll just say that um, if anyone is interested in further information, please just go to the survey link and give us your information via that so we can follow up with you. But a few points um, to note just that this is a, a program that Ed is looking to expand to many areas. So he would love to hear from you if you would like to help expand it in your area. And um, the, you know, some of the costs are, are covered, but some of the costs were also, he's also looking for um, funding to help support it. But it's not that the schools are charged for this um, activity. We're looking, he's looking to have it all be um, funded by uh, donations, et cetera. So we encourage you to help think about ideas on how to expand this. So I have a first question here for Dr. Abraham. So you just have to unmute yourself. Um, the question is, Nobel laureates are fairly busy people. Why should one, a Nobel laureate, take time out to talk to high school students? Well, <laughs> um, uh, that was sort of my thinking uh, before I gave my first talk because I, I don't really spend much time talking to high school kids. And it really um, it blew me away. It was just, it was nothing, you know, I've given, you know, thousands of talks in my in my career. and uh, But I really don't talk to high school students by and large. And, uh, and there they were asking me about how many hours of sleep I get and uh, uh, the mistakes I make. And it, it was just terrific. It was such a, an innocent, honest, open environment that the kids created and i really uh, uh i welcomed it it was uh, it was uh, it, it, it helped me grow it changed me great thank you so much um next question is for the principal ken jing um how did you how did students prepare for the visit and also what kind of follow-up did you do with the students after the presentation okay in terms of preparation for the visit uh, in natural curiosity, they tried to figure out everything they could possibly find out about Dr. And so, in the end, there was a list of 25 or so questions all about his life. And again, as other speakers have pointed out, it wasn't necessarily about why he was awarded the prize per se. It was about, geez, how did you decide to go into chemistry? And what did you do when you kept on trying things that didn't work? How did you persevere? 
And on the reverse side, when we debriefed, we, we talked with students and said, you know, quick, what's the one or two word summary of the experience? And that's where that inspiration and inspired came out. And then we talked more deeply and they actually had a written response that they had to complete about the impact of this kind of presentation upon their ideas for the future and their thoughts. And a couple months later, we informally followed up with students and the memories were still vivid and the ideas were still there. And they just said, no, it's about passion and hard work and curiosity and those are good things. And I feel, in a sense, you know, valued for that, hearing from people outside our school community that that's important. So that's how we play with those pieces. Great, thank you, Ken. Um, that's terrific. So Michelle, the next question is for you, so you just need to unmute your line. So um, where are, um, are you at Biocision planning to expand the program next in working with the Nobel Laureate School Business Program? And how can other companies or individuals participate? So what are your ideas there, Michelle? Right. Well, as I mentioned, we are just getting started here in the Bay Area, so there's still quite a lot of expansion we can do here locally as we have a really large reservoir of um, Nobel laureates to draw from on our local universities. We're also uh, currently looking um, to Southern California where um, we have some personnel as well who can assist us in that. And then um, beyond California, I'm aware of some opportunities that might exist in other states, so we're starting to expand uh, into other states potentially in the near future as well. I don't have any specifics yet, but um, uh, there's a couple of states that I know that are interested. So um, across the United States, hopefully. I mean, we'd like to take this to as many schools as possible with, uh, with Dr. Shapiro. It's a great program, and um, other people can get involved by um, – I would say probably initially, you know, contacting Dr. Shapiro or myself and let us know how you want to get involved, but we can certainly, I think Dr. Shapiro can use financial support as well as outreach support, um, finding schools or, uh, you know, contacting local principals who might be interested and then offering up those suggestions uh, through, through Dr. Shapiro's website. Great. Thank you, Michelle. So yes, and we at Cambridge Health Tech Associates, we're also thrilled to be um, part of sponsoring this and helping to spread the word and, and partnering with uh, Dr. Ed Shapiro. Um, so Ed, I'm going to give you the next question. Um, so what prompted you to come up with this and uh, what would you best or most like to see as the next step that people take in, um, in working with you on this fabulous program? I've been uh, unmuted. Um, thank you. Uh, this is what I have to, to share with you. I came to this country in '79 from from a dictatorship to the very best country in the world, and this is my sincere and honest desire to contribute to its well-being and greatness. And this is how I discovered a possibility to do so, to create a program this nation would benefit from and walk ahead to, to its great future. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ed. Um, so that we've had uh, quite a few questions come in, and I do see that it's just about at the top of the hour. So if we haven't gotten to your question, please feel free to send it in to either um, myself or to Dr. Um, Ed Shapiro, and we can address it specifically afterwards. But um, I guess the, the last general question is, how can we get Nobel laureates to our own community? Is there an application process? And I'll say, yes, there is an application process that um, you complete with um, Dr. Shapiro. Um, it, he also does have a website, um, but we're going to be looking at helping him take that to the next level over the next while. while. And, um, and uh, I guess the, the question here is, how, how do we um, engage? And I think um, Michelle and Ed have answered that question quite well. 
So maybe I'll put the very last question over to um, Dr. Abraham. So what influence or difference did winning the Nobel Prize have or make in your scientific and or social life? And in your experience, can a, a, devote, a person who's devoted to, uh, um, let's say, religion also be a devoted scientist? Well, um, uh, it, it, it didn't make much uh, of an impact on my social life, because, uh, in part because uh, I prefer being treated like a person and not an icon. And so I, I, I really practically never talk about the Nobel uh, in public uh, or with friends or um, uh, this this uh, program being the exception, I think. Um, and uh, in terms of religion versus science, uh, I think we've just settled that uh, question pretty clearly. Uh, of course, uh, religion is a powerful force in the world and for good and for evil. Um, um, but is there a contradiction between uh, uh, my uh, religious experience or uh, education and uh, being a scientist? Uh, not, not at all. I, I, um, it's a very simple answer, and it comes actually from my, my Lutheran education. I, um, uh, in in uh, Thomas Aquinas' work, he describes knowledge as being a kind of a pyramid, and the base of the pyramid he calls reason, and the top of the pyramid he calls revelation. And I think science lives in the reason world, and religion lives in the revelation world. And they don't necessarily have to be uh, contradictory. So that's my answer. Great. Well, thank you so much. That's fabulous. So I'll just close it out with one comment from one of our attendees today, um, from Nalina, who said, um, all in all, it seems to be a great program to encourage education. Great effort. And I'm going to direct that to Ed and all the Nobel laureates and everyone who's been involved so far. And she says, thanks for doing this. It is a great need, especially in high schools where students are transitioning into the future. Encouraging the learning is essential. So I couldn't agree with um, those comments more. It's just a fabulous opportunity, I think, for everyone to do their own little piece and help spread the word and help inspire everyone in middle school and high school to be the very best that they can possibly be. So thank you, everyone, for attending this. We will send you a recording of it afterwards so you can share it. Um, as far and wide as you possibly can and get more people to join this terrific initiative. So thanks again to Ed Shapiro and the rest of the speakers today, and we look forward to staying involved with this over the years to come. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dom. Our pleasure. Everybody. Thanks. You're the best. Thank you.